Okay, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to look at analyzing the data. So we are going to look for correlations and the distribution of data. We are going to try and make sense of this data. So make sure you get out your pen or pencil, your note-taking sheet, and you follow the storm philosophy for note-taking, and sit back and enjoy. So here's what we're going to look at. What do we do with the data now? Remember today we took a look at entering the data into a spreadsheet and having a coded uh, set of information, but what do we do with that data now? So this is where we need to make sense of the data. We need to look for correlations and look at the distribution of the data. So we're going to look at four different distributions, normal, bimodal, uniform, and skewed, and try and make sense of it. So by this point in time, you've taken all of your survey data, you've entered into some sort of spreadsheet, some sort of document in which you can look at the numbers. But that's all it is. All it is is a set of numbers. It's a bunch of numbers that have no meaning. The only way those numbers have meaning is if you interpret the information. And there's various ways you can interpret. The two that we'll look at today follow. So the two interpretations that we're really going to look at are correlations and distribution. Correlations have to do with two sets of numbers, two sets of data sets. Distribution, we look at one question, and how does the numbers stack up? So the first are correlations. How can you make connections between questions? How can you make a connection between gender, so the gender of the survey respondents, and their preference for brand of cola? How can you make a correlation between or a connection between income and maybe type of transportation they take to work? To make these connections, you need to look for correlations. Correlations allow you to see connections between the data. Often these connections are made between demographic characteristics and psychographic characteristics. So, for example, if you want to find out a particular age group that participate in skateboarding, you will need to find a correlation. This allows you to really address the interests of your target market. Not just that there's maybe 11 females who answer the survey and 9 males. It's really how many of those females like Coca-Cola versus Pepsi. How many of those males take a car to work versus a bus. Those are correlations and those give much more meaning than just the raw numbers. So to give you an example, pretend I surveyed four people. The gender, income, favorite flavor of juice and the amount they're willing to pay for that juice are shown as follows. There are three males in the survey. There's one female. There are two people who have incomes between 30 and $39 per week, one over 40 and one zero to nine. There are three people who like grape flavored juice versus lime, and there are two people who are willing to pay $3 for their juice versus one who are over five and one who is $1. All of this is just data on its own. It doesn't tell us enough. Correlations can begin to tell us more. Think about this now. How many males, or the percentage of males, like grape flavored juice? If you look for the correlation here, you'll see that 100% of males like grape flavored juice. So if you were to target your juice, and your juice is grape, who would you target it towards? Well, I hope you would say males. How about this one? Who is willing to spend $3? Well, males and females are willing to spend $3. Males and females also like grape versus lime. So the favorite flavor doesn't determine the amount willing to pay. But what might determine the amount willing to pay is the income of our respondents. Those people who are 30 to $39 and earn 30 to $39 in income also are willing to pay $3 for their juice. That gives us much more information than just looking at the numbers on their own. And that's the power of correlations. The next way to really interpret the data is to look for the pattern that exists within the data. It's distribution. And there are four major distributions that we'll look at. The first one is normal distribution. This is what we commonly refer to as bell curves or mound shape. The middle interval will have the greatest frequency. That is the tallest bar of our bar graph. All other intervals will have decreasing frequencies. So as you move away from the middle, you start lowering the value or the frequency. The graph on the right shows you favorite chocolate bars. Chocolate bar brands have been coded from 2 through 12. Let's say 7 was Mars. That has the most frequency. As we move away from Mars into various other brands, it has decreasing frequency. This is a normal distribution. This is often what we see when we look at incomes or other 
numerical data sets. But this is something that we also have to be familiar with when we're looking at various marketing questions on our surveys. The next one is bimodal distribution. Now this is basically taking the normal distribution and flipping it. This is an inverted normal distribution. The greatest frequency are on the edges. The lowest frequency is in the middle. So it looks like almost a bowl. So on the edges is where the greatest frequency and in the middle is the lowest frequency. This gives us more information. Would we, let's say, cater our products to those people who are middle in height? Maybe not. We might cater more towards those extremes, and that's very important, and this distribution will tell us this. The next is uniform distributions. This is a consistent level of frequency. So at each interval, there's approximately equal respondents. There is no great frequency, nor is there a low frequency. So if we were to ask a question and we get a frequency such as this, it would mean that the satisfaction level is even right across the board. There is no great satisfaction with the sport. There is no low satisfaction with the sport. Every single satisfaction level are evenly distributed. And the last is skewed distribution. The bars with the greatest frequency are now found on one side of the graph or the other. A right skewed distribution has bars or data that is higher on the left side and the frequencies decrease as you move right. A left skewed distribution has data that's highest on the right side and the frequencies decrease as you move left. So the bars with the greatest frequency in a left skewed distribution like you see in the graph is towards the right. Okay, That's a left skewed distribution. So this is basically shifting the normal distribution all the way to the edge. And this is what we sometimes see when we're giving out tests and averages on these tests are skewed. Right? If the information or if the data that you've collected is skewed, you need to be aware of this. So this brings us to our end. And really the question now becomes, what kinds of correlations would you like to make with this, your survey data that you will pr provide to survey respondents for your assignment or for your marketing plan? What kind of correlations will you look for? Think about connecting a demographic question with a psychographic question or a competitive question with a consumer question. The other part to this is the distributions. What does each distribution really tell you about the data? I showed you what each distribution looks like, but what does it all mean? Well, that's something you have to think about. We'll talk about it more in class, but I want you to think about it now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, make sure your notes are in order. Make sure you have your summaries complete, you've provided a discussion question, and you've at least attempted to answer these questions I've put forth to you. That's it. That's all. That's everything. We will see you tomorrow.